There you go. That's Gary Moore there. And after the war, welcome to Mark King and Mike Lindup of Level 42 in town tonight for <laughs> for the gig at the Point Depot. Um, not your first time to to Ireland, so I'm not going to say welcome to Ireland, but welcome to the beatbox. Anyhow, thanks. Uh, is the gig tonight? Is it a one-off or is it part of a, a another another Level 42 tour? Well, it's um it's been part of the the tour. We've just been doing like the British tour, and uh, this is the only show that we're doing here in Ireland. Uh, in Southern Ireland, I suppose. We're playing in Northern Ireland at Belfast on Monday. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, we, we've got about five shows left to do. And then we're finished. We've been out since September of last year, at the end of September. Mm. And um, it seems funny because it seems like only yesterday that we were here, but in fact it's, it's about a year ago now. Right, okay. Mike, wh why, why do you spend so much time on the road as a band? Because, I mean, you do tour quite, quite extensively, more than most, I would think. Is it, is, it's obviously something you enjoy quite a bit, isn't it? Well, it is. I mean, it's turned out to be our best promotion um, from, you know, when we started touring, um, mm. I suppose, in 81 and 82. We found that uh, we built up a very good audience playing live and uh, that seemed to sell the records. And the more we toured, the better effect it seemed to have. And so we've therefore sort of had a policy of touring a lot. Uh, and it's also very enjoyable to play live and, and can be very rewarding as well. Do you think it's better than maybe getting a record played on the radio to get out there and play in front of 10 or 15,000 people? Well, I mean, I, I don't think it's better necessarily, but it's just that uh, <coughs> um, it, the music comes across very well live. And, mm. um, you know, it's perhaps the record and all the tracks on the record aren't always going to be played on the radio. Right. Maybe only the singles okay. will be, but uh, people get more of an idea of the the sort of range of the band if they come to see the live show. Mm. So Mark, was life on the road a little bit to do with the fact that uh, Boone and Phil decided to to leave the band and just relax for a while? Um, uh, yes, I mean that was uh, probably the largest part of, of them leaving the band when they did uh, because it's it, it ha when you're traveling a lot on the road um, I mean it sounds very exciting and it is to, to all intents and purposes very exciting and when you get on stage it's terrific but there's, when you keep on doing it, the, the sort of the magic wears off and you, you find that you've been to all the places and you start going to the same places again and again and again. Um, it becomes quite tiresome, really. And you have to, um, I don't know, I, I suppose you've got to really dig down deep inside and pull out something that makes you want to keep going and, mm. and keep on doing it. Do new songs have that effect on you? Like, here's a new song, let's sure. get out there and play. M most certainly, yeah. But then you, you also have to try and temper that with the fact that people want to hear a lot of older stuff as well. Right. And this is probably the eighth year that you're now playing it. You know? Yeah, yeah, okay. How do they let you know? I mean, it must have come as quite a shock. I mean, it would be bad enough if one member of the band had decided to quit, but the two of them together, I mean, that must have been... Well, it, it wasn't together. I mean, that Phil had said that he was going to be wanting to go for ages, um, you know, but, and boom, he just said, just like that, that he wanted to go. But I mean, like, it's that, that, that's all so so far in the past now, and that the band's been that we've been out, we've got new albums since then. There's so much water's gone under the bridge. I don't know why you want to talk about such a depressing thing. Well, I mean, is it really depressing? Because really. it was a perfectly amicable sp uh, split, if you could call it that. Because I mean, all they did was say, "Look, lads, we've had enough on the road, and we're going, we're going to take it easy for a while, or we're going to do other things." So it wasn't, it wasn't like you had a big argument about the whole thing, was it? No, so forget it. <laughs> okay, all right, then fair enough. So that's, fine. that's fine. You've got Gary Husband and Alan Murphy in the band now. They replaced them. Let's talk about yes. nice happy. Oh things. yeah. Oh, let's talk about happy things. Yeah. Where did, where did, where did you come across those guys? Well, um, we actually knew that Gary Husband was going to be the man for us um, mm. when Phil said he was going to leave. Um, we phoned him up and at the time he was working with a jazz guitarist called Alan Holdsworth, a very good guitarist, and when he became free he immediately rushed over and joined us here in Dublin beginning of last year and we started to rehearse with him mm. and you know all our feelings about him turned out to be right. Yeah. Um, it was a bit harder to find a guitarist but uh, eventually um, we discovered that Alan Murphy, who came down to play on the album that we were recording, um, you know, seemed to work out very well. He seemed to understand the sort of thing that we wanted from a guitarist. And so yeah. we said, well, you know, join the band and come and play with us live. What's his pedigree? Where did he come from? What other bands did he play? Oh, um, oh gosh. Well, he's, Alan's done a lot of session work, which means that he's played with a lot of artists. Um, probably at the, at the moment, I think he's on the Mike and the Mechanics record. Great. And he's done Kate Bush in the past and Go West, of course. Most mm. people recognize right, his face yes. from. Um, Scritti Pulisi. 
So he's a, he's a pretty good all rounder, we can we can say, and uh, yeah. and they're but working out. Them. They're, they're working, yeah, exactly. They're working out very well for the band. It's it's, it's as good as you expected it to be with the new guys. Isn't oh it? yeah, it's certainly it's it's better than I hoped it would be because it's so much more relaxed yeah. now than uh, it was before. That pr probably largely because um, them coming into the 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 band, as it were. Um, that we're used to trying to foster a band atmosphere. I mean, it's very hard to try and put in the words. That, but we, we like to sort of foster a band atmosphere whereby everybody feels that they're pulling um, in the same direction. Mm. But I think it makes it easier for them because they think, well, Mark and Mike um, know where they're going, so we'll follow along. Yeah. Which tends to mean that um, decisions aren't quite the compromise that they used to be. It's very much a case of people saying, well, what do you want to do? And myself or Mike say, well, I think we should do this. Mm. And then uh, and then we do that. Mm. So in that respect, it, it makes it much more relaxed. So you two are very much the leaders in the band, though. Well, I think that we are by the nature of the fact that we've been doing it for eight years and that Gary and Alan have, right. have, have, have only just recently joined us. Mm. But I, I'd like to think that, I mean, we've we've already talked about making the next record and, and the next tour that we do, which uh, incidentally will be a couple of years down the line mm. because the next record that we make be we're going to take a lot longer over making. We want it to be just the best one we can possibly do. Okay. We'll, we'll talk about more, uh, more about that a little bit later on. Tonight's gig, uh, Mike, uh, some of the proceeds are going towards uh, Childline. Not the first time you've been involved in doing things for charity and things like that, is it? Um, we have been involved in a couple of things in the past. Um, for example, the record Children Say, some of the royalties from that mm -hmm. went to the Great Ormond Street Hospital Fund. Right. And... Um, well, it's very funny that you should mention Children Say by Level 42. It really is. Purely by coincidence, here it is on the Beatbox. As Children Say from Level 42, Mark and Mike, my guests on the Beatbox today. Um, Mark, looking back over the last, what, nine years as a band, and how many LPs, eight or nine LPs? Um, well, I, yeah, either. Yeah. All of that. <laughs> how, uh, all right, all of that. How has the music changed, I if at all? Oh, I think it's changed a lot um, uh, over the years, uh, mainly because... Uh, we, we've tried never to work on a formula. I know this will come as a surprise to any journalists that listen to this. Say, oh, my goodness. The they never listen to again. this program. It's too good for that. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> That's good, then. Um, but we, we've... Uh, any sort of our history of releasing singles, for example, has been a, a, a case of... If you follow that, if you listen to the latest single compared to the last one, you'll find that they really don't have much in common with each other. They're quite different. Mm. And that um, is quite good because we've... It means that when we're sort of going about making the music, we're not saying, oh, you know, uh, something about you is a big hit. Let's make another load of something about you. Yeah. Or Lessons in Love was a big hit, so let's make another um, another lot of songs like that. You know, that we always try and do something that's different and, and try and go very much from the fact that, you know, that we think this is a good song. Let's... let's put this one in right. see how it goes. Okay. Yeah. And in that case, I think that you and you always sort of you take another step on when you go down the line. Mm. Do you, Mike, do you still listen to the, the old LPs? Occasionally, yes. I mean, I suppose out of of habit of, of working with Level 42 most of the time, because it does take up most of the time, when I tend to listen to music at home, I tend to listen to other things. I think it's the same with Mark. Mm. But I do listen back to the old stuff. And how does it feel when you listen back to an album that you recorded, say, four or five years ago? Well, I mean, obviously, you, you tend to be quite critical of, of mm. yourself. You listen back and mm. think, oh, did we, did we really do that? Yeah. Or did we really produce a sound like that? But I always feel, on the other hand, you know, we did the, the best that we could do mm. at the time, and it was what we were into at the time. Do, do you reckon that in five years' time you'll be as critical uh, of staring at the sun as you are of the records that you, that you are, are I would, now? I would think so, yeah. Mm. Mm. It seems to me that the, the stuff that you're doing now is less jazz funky, jazz jazz funk, th than, it, than it was. Is that a, is that a deliberate <laughs> uh, well, move for, on your part? I, I suppose, um, I don't know, if you take a song like Man on the album, uh, which is uh, quite... Uh, it, it's it's quite a long track. I mean, it's not in a single format, if you like. And it was mm. it was what we did that when we were writing it, we just sort of followed our nose as it was unfolding in front of us. And it has quite a lot of um, sort of the second half of the song is quite instrumental, and um, sort of harmonically it explores quite a lot of weird things. Mm. And I think that that is might be considered jazzy, right? Uh, as opposed to something like I don't know why, which is sort of much more. Uh, sort of pop. I, I think that we, we've, in, in other words, it, we didn't try not to be this jazz funk, and I think there are elements in, in the music. It's just that now perhaps they're a bit more defined than they used to be. Whereas before they used to be one type of thing, 
we tend to hop about a bit more. In the, in the mid, late 70s, you were definitely heaped into the jazz funk uh, sort of <laughs> group. Uh, did, did you mind that? Uh, it's a great expression, heaped in. Yeah, well, <laughs> thrown in there with the rest heaped of on. Yeah. I've always felt heaped on. Um, we always, we always fought, a, yeah. fought that tag, really. I suppose when we were a young band, um, you know, you always think that you're the best thing since sliced bread, and you always think that what you do is highly original and, and can't be possibly like anybody else. Yes. And so when we were grouped with other people like Shack Attack and Light of the right. World and Lynx and so on, we tended to say, well, you know, we're not a jazz funk band because I suppose we felt that we had potential to become something that would have its own sound eventually. Mm -hmm. But when we listen back now and listen to the early tapes now, you can you can say, well, it does sound rather jazz funk. Uh, and the ba most of the bands that you've mentioned, if not all, uh, of all of those bands, you're the only ones left. I mean, Shack Attack aren't really making any hits anymore. Lynx aren't there anymore. Well, I suppose that they, um, I mean, the people like um, David Grant. David Grant. Yeah, right. it, it sort of is working on, on other things now, and I think that Bill Sharp does other things. I think that what happens is that they, they change. All that we did was that we kept our name, Level 42, mm. and um, perhaps because we, we kept our profile aimed much more at the, um, the, the charts, if mm. you like, mm. whereas they didn't. They, it was always very unhit for them to put a record in the chart. Right. How many trying to consider where, where now, they might have gone? Now that you mentioned the name, where did it come from as a matter of interest, level 42? Mike, you're guilty. Yes. Uh, well, I'm not guilty, but um, <laughs> I'm not with the answer. Just has to answer the, the finger question. was pointed straight away, no hesitation, anyway. Yes. Um, well, the 42 came from The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, mm -hmm. uh, that very successful book and radio series that later became a TV series. Mm -hmm. um, look, looking for a name <laughs> um, is really the hardest thing. Um, because we wanted to find something that didn't mean anything but would be a good name to have and mm. become related with the music eventually. And we took the 42 from the book and we thought, well, it's a good name because it doesn't mean anything, it's easy to yeah. remember. And our first producer thought it wasn't long enough, so he suggested it should be level 42. And the rest is history. Oh, okay. absolutely. Level that, that, that question doesn't get any easier. <laughs> <laughs> here's, here's another song from the band. This is called It's Over. Level 42 there, of course, and it's over my guests on the beatbox today. Mike, on the, on the latest album, what are, what are your favourite songs? Um, I always tend to avoid this question. Yeah, well, you're um, not avoiding it now, sometimes. <laughs> and, uh, well, it's, the thing is that I really do like the variety of songs that we do and um, the fact that you've got different moods over the album. Um, and I haven't got a favourite song. And, uh, come on, uh, <laughs> come on. <laughs> All right, well, you twisted my arm. Um, if I had to pick songs that particularly that, well, I like Heaven in My Hands. I like, um, I don't know why. All the hits. I like Over There. I like Silence. I like Man. I should I have asked you what you don't like, really, if <laughs> we got through that. What about you, Mark? What, what about your favourites on the LP? Have you any? Um, yeah, I think I, I really like, uh... Well, I like Two Hearts Collide a lot because I, I sort of, I, I feel that someone should defend that one. I, well, I've actually heard, I've, I've in the past heard some people talking about that track as being a yeah. particularly nice one. Well, I'll tell you that there's a, we, um, you know, in the course of work on the album stuff, um, I've got, what's, his, what's our mate's name in New York? Oh, Tom Lord Algy. Yeah, Tom Lord Algy's done a remix of it and it's just great mm. that uh, I really like that. And it'll probably never see the light of day, but it's a really, I think it's a great version of that song. Mm. And I, I've... Um, I mean, I I like all the songs. I mean, I don't know if you're sort of winkling away at the fact that I was misquoted in the press recently. No, I'm not. That I didn't like the. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, didn't, I never read the same music. Uh, about me saying that I didn't like the record. Well, it was a, a misquote and taken out of context. I just said that, as Mike said earlier on, there are some things about the album that now, in retrospect, like uh, nearly a year on, um, I don't think we should have done differently. Mm. But then I think that about all the records, right? You know that, that you, it's a, like a time capsule, really. It's like us talking now. Something may happen when I leave the studio that'll make me change my mind drastically about okay. things, and it will be different. And records are like all, that too. all very relative. Were, were all the songs on the new album written in Dublin? Yeah, um, yes, they were, weren't yes, they? they were. And they were. How, how long did you spend here? Uh, whilst, whilst you were writing, about writing two months. About 85 cheesecakes. Yeah, okay, right. We, we, you were staying in the Gresham Hotel here in Dublin. And uh, what is this about the cheesecake in the Gresham Hotel? We've been hearing a lot about it. We, we have some very good friends at the Gresham Hotel. And... Uh, <laughs> so we have to be very careful of what we say. Oh, no, no, no. no. Honestly, no, the, it's, it's really the nicest place I could think of staying outside of my house. Right. And um, they're very friendly. And they all, they always sort of... Um, cheesecake isn't on the room service menu, but they they sort of... They slipped it on for me, um, mainly because that was all there was when we first stayed there. 
And then it, I sort of got addicted to it. Mm. So in the end, uh, like last night when we arrived back, I phoned up the woman at um, the Aberdeen restaurant, and she said, uh, you know, uh, uh, she said, I recognise your voice. How are you doing? I said, just fine, thanks. And she said, well, you know, will it be the usual? And um, they sent up two slices of cheesecake, which I thought was very nice. It's pretty bad when your dessert becomes the usual. Well, I'll tell you, you know, since then, I've had a, um, I've had a studio built at home. And I've actually had the studio decorated in the same colours as the Gresham restaurant. Well, wow. They yeah. will be happy. They will be happy. Well, it's because uh, it, it's so relaxing in there, yeah, you know? Yeah. Mike, do, do, did you mind having to live in a hotel for, for two months at a stretch? That's, that's quite a long time to be away from home and living in a hotel atmosphere, no matter how good the hotel is. It is a long time. And, uh, I mean, we were there to work, and in a sense, it, um, the best thing that you can do, really, is to be in a situation where perhaps you can't go running away mm. and uh, you have to actually do the work that you were put there for. Right. So it was good in that sense. But I mean, I did go out once in a while. I mean, my birthday's on St. Patrick's Day and last year, of course, there was the big parade mm. down O'Connell Street. So I took that day off and sort of, you know, jumped in with the crowds with my video camera and so yeah. on. I yeah. thought that was for your birthday. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Wow. <laughs> so is it, because last year, uh, presumably when you wrote most of the songs for the album, uh, was our millennium year. I have to ask you the question, while well, the city manager w will be after me, uh, is there any of Dublin in the songs? Well, yes. <laughs> is the yeah, short that's answer that's to that? No, but, well, there Thank is, you very uh, much, Level fact, 42. Uh, <laughs> there's, uh, there's, uh, well, there's an instrumental dedicated to the Gresham Hotel called the Gresham Blues, which um, appears on the CD and cassette. No, it's not on the album. But, it's uh, on the B-side of one of the singles. Oh, yes, it is, yes. So you should probably buy that as well. Um, <laughs> so, yes. So there is just a little bit of Dublin in, 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 the, in the songs. There. Well, in that be, song. yeah. yeah. There's a lot of cheesecake in there. Yeah, sure. okay. Did you find then, as you were living in Dublin, you had no problems travelling around town? Nobody gave you any hassle or aggro or anything like that? No, everyone was just very, very friendly. Yeah, yeah, no. mm -hmm. In fact, I would like to have been hassled by more women. Okay, well, we'll arrange that, as a matter of fact. Let's open the telephone that. lines now. Uh, Mike, before you became a, a musician, uh, what sort of ambitions did you have? Did you always want to be a keyboard player? Um, well, I started, I, I suppose, um, learning music at a very young age. I had piano lessons from when I was six. Mm. Um, there was always music in the house, and both my parents were involved in music, so it kind of it rubbed off. Mm. And um, I used to enjoy drawing when I was young, but that sort of faded away as music took over, so and I had a classical education, so music's always tended to be a pretty big thing in my life. We hear, we hear constantly about, about children learning to play keyboard, piano, whatever, that it's important that they start at a very young age. Do you think that, that, that's true? I think it's, I think, providing it's enjoyable and it's fun, I think it's great if you start at a young age. Because yeah. But that, so many of them find it quite boring, don't they, playing scales all the time? Well, drums are a good thing, you know, for mm. young kids. Oh, yeah. I've yeah. got a three-year-old son and I, I got him a drum kit for Christmas. Mm. And it's just like one of these little ones. Yeah. And that's fantastic because, like Mike said, about it being enjoyable. Yes, it's aggression it, as well, isn't it? Yeah, well, yeah, aggression <laughs> hotel. Yeah. The, um, <laughs> If you, he sits on it, and I mean, like, you know, he doesn't have to be aware of, the, like, harmony and melody and all yeah. that sort of stuff, which his dad isn't aware of either. <laughs> Plus but he can sit down and thrash around. And yeah. you've got a soundproof room to stick him in when he's doing that, of course. <laughs> Otherwise, the neighbours might be complaining. No, no, they'd be all right about it. Yeah. But I think the drums, in terms of, like, any musician, uh, drums are a good thing to, to, to know about. Mm. Is it true, then, Mark, that you only learned to play the bass guitar because, really, you, you had to? You were working but at a really, shop or yes. something? Yes, I mean, it's, I, I mean I, it's, it's not because I had to. I, I wanted to learn to play it, but it was, it was definitely, uh, I suppose, a second choice because I wanted to be a drummer in London. Mm. And um, it didn't work out that way, you know, that mm. Phil was the drummer in Level 42 and, and, and we were sort of good friends. And what, if Phil was in a band like Reflex and then he left to do M, I joined Reflex as the drummer and stuff. And it was always, it's very much, you know, friends of friends stuff. Yeah, yeah. But in Level 42, that they're... It, it wasn't, there wasn't the space for two drums. And I'd been working at Macari's music shop in the Chan Cross Road and learned to play bass. And mm. You reckon to be, pro uh, I'm sure you've heard this, so I'm not, just, I'm not just saying it, I'm sure you've heard it before, but you reckon to be the best player, bass player in the world. I have heard this. Yes. <laughs> well, well, I think Thank a lot you. of people reckon that it's true. It's also rumoured that, uh, that you have your hands insured for a million pounds. Is that true? Oh, yes. Now, you're not avoiding that. Come no, on. I'm not avoiding that. No, they are insured. Um, for, for a million pounds? Well, more, actually. How much more? Well, three God. times more. Three million pounds? Yes. But only because of... Uh, Is that Irish or sterling? <laughs> no, that's pounds sterling. And uh, would you want to know the insurance broker? <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> the uh, Robertson's, whatever they <laughs> Three million quid is an awful lot of money to insure your, your hands for. Well, I th we, 
I, I think that we are going to earn an awful lot of money, and the thing is that mm. it's it's just an insurance against, you know, it's like if you spend a lot of money on a car, you insure your car, or if you have possessions in your household, mm. you insure them a lot, because something might happen. Mm. And I think that if Level 42, because it's become such a, uh, a big selling group, mm. can make X amount of millions of pounds. I mean, we don't see all of that, and I don't see my insurance money. I don't, you know, look. <laughs> okay, okay. You know, right. It doesn't make any difference. But somebody somewhere is insuring them because they think, well, it, we, we should at least cover it for that because if he falls over and breaks his pinky, you know. Mm. But, uh, mm. Okay. On the latest single, finally, it's called Tracy. Who is Tracy? Tracy is really the girl that you first fell in love with or had something going with, should I say, at, really? at school. Yes. Yeah. And um, she's a sort of universal figure in a sense. Mm. And um, Gary Husband, uh, the drummer who wrote the lyrics um, had someone particular in mind but uh, it's something that we can all relate to pretty easily yeah that's good okay I like that we're going to have a look at the video for that now uh, Mark and Mike thank you very much indeed for coming in level 42 of the point depot tonight and this is the latest single Tracy thanks Barry thank you thank you